Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne Herod Lang. I'm pleased to be serving as your host for today's webinar, Negotiating Access for Humanitarian Protection. This is the second webinar out of four in a series organized by the NRC, the Global Protection Cluster, and PHAP, with financial support from USAID, in which we'll be looking at the challenges faced by practitioners related to access and humanitarian protection. As mentioned, this is the second webinar in a series of four in which we will be looking at how humanitarian protection relates to access. Last month, in our first introductory series, event in this series, we asked you to submit the types of challenges related to access and protection that you're currently facing in your work so that we could focus the remaining sessions on the issues that concerned you the most. Today, we'll be focusing on the challenges that practitioners face when trying to gain or maintain access for protection, whether negotiating directly for protection programming access or negotiating for humanitarian access in general while considering protection concerns. While negotiating for access for humanitarian assistance is often challenging in and of itself, Practitioners and organizations face a distinct set of issues in access negotiations that relate to protection. Now, to introduce our panel, we're joined today by a panel of practitioners, each with an extensive experience of dealing with questions related to protection and access in different contexts. I'm first of all very happy to welcome Tiffany Eastom, Executive Director of Nonviolent Peace Force, joining us from Geneva. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. And also joining us from Geneva is Hichem Kadrawi, Director of Operations of Geneva Call, who previously also worked for over a decade in various response contexts with the ICRC. Good to have you on the line, Hichem. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. And next we have Jochen Rick, uh, Head of Field Coordination in the Access and Deconfliction Unit in Yemen, but right now calling in from the west coast of the United States. Welcome, uh, Jochen, and a special thanks for joining us at such an early hour where you are. Thank you very much for having me. And last but not least, I'm very glad to have with us again Paul White. Paul is a PROCAP Senior Protection Advisor with PROCAP being administered by NRC. Welcome back, Paul. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here indeed. Now, before we jump into the discussion, I'd just like to take a quick look at the types of issues we'll be dealing with in this session. More than 400 of you completed the pre-event questionnaire on which types of issues you had faced in your work and submitted examples uh, of these issues, concrete examples from your experience. I think that one point is worth making at the outset, that these are all very commonly occurring issues, with each of them being experienced between 29, uh, roughly 30% to 60% of the respondents. So we see a lot of, uh, a lot of shared experience uh, with these, these particular challenges uh, amongst those uh, who have joined the event today. Now, we'll start with one of the more common issues that's been submitted. When authorities invite organizations to provide assistance following or during a crisis, but they do not want protection activities to be a part of this. Uh, before looking at some of the examples that have been submitted by participants, I'd first like to turn to Paul uh, to ask, have you, Paul, seen this type of situation in practice, and do you have any general recommendations for practitioners for humanitarian organizations dealing with this kind of issue, this kind of broad issue? Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ed Herod. Yes, um, I come across this very often, so I'm not surprised other colleagues do as well. Um, I think one thing we need to bear in mind is that authorities often want to be seen to be providing for their constituents. So they especially like to do something, give something physical. Um, and of course, the assistance we give is also part of protection. But I find that access negotiations are not the best time to start explaining to authorities what protection and human rights are. It's best if we can start our conversation uh, with the authorities or the gatekeepers about in the situation they find themselves in. So it might mean we're talking about some physical assistance or financial assistance, 
we focus on how protection actors might be able to help the authorities. So that's one thing that I think it's important to bear in mind. Another is it's always important that we don't lose sight of the small picture when we want uh, access. We need to focus on the people in need. Uh, so for example, I've seen Tiffany's agency, the Nonviolent Police Force, in the very deep field taking on simple yet quite dangerous tasks like accompanying people to and from food distributions to keep them safe. It's a small job in a sense, but it's very important and it was very helpful for the humanitarian community to get access by offering to do to provide that sort of assistance. So there are things like that. The other thing that's important is partnerships. Um, I'm sure many of you know that WFP colleagues uh, are often in the lead uh, working with OCHA to, to negotiate for access. Sometimes health or shelter or mine action or others might be there um, also. But um, these agencies and particularly WFP colleagues can step in for us if we can't get protection into a negotiation um, on its own terms. Uh, WFP is just one example of a UN agency that's moved ahead leaps and bounds on protection over the last decade. So we need to be prepared and ready to work with uh, other agencies. The Global Protection Cluster now has a MOU with the Health Cluster, the Global Health Cluster. IOM have a protection policy. Mainstreaming has been around for a long time. So we need to involve other agencies. We don't need to see protection as something that's exclusive to um, uh, our protection actors. Um, another issue that I see is that um, governments are less keen to give us access. Previously, there was a clear distinction between what happened in a conflict what happened in a natural disaster or a climate emergency. But these days, governments are demanding of protection people in both situations. So it's important that somehow we are able to show them that we are uh, able to assist with the immediate problem. One thing that prevents us getting access sometimes is if we go in to talk about a long-term development problem, for example, that's been there for years, um, without offering any immediate assistance. So I think we need to be careful of that. Crucial also though is the analysis, the importance of our protection analysis. Um, I found myself in one situation where a mullah who led the local very conservative community was prepared to accept some protection, child protection assistance from UNICEF who I was with at the time as a pro-cap. Um, but his conservative community didn't want assistance. So it highlighted for me that our analysis needs to understand not just the motivation of the leadership, but also the community attitudes. We can't get access unless we have a good grasp of, of those uh, attitudes. Um, I've worked in situations where authorities fear that protection people will go searching for bodies um, that are buried or fearful that we might identify other human rights abusers. So again, when we're negotiating access, we need to be articulating our motives clearly and we need to be careful what we're prepared to articulate. Sometimes it's as simple as authorities fear a loss of faith. This is important in, more important in some cultures than others, but it's something that we need to watch um, so we need to be careful just how we approach the authorities when we're talking about access. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes down to we need to do our analysis, find out exactly uh, what the entry point should be and what would be acceptable to the, the local authorities and the gatekeepers. Um, we also need to take a longer term view often. So sometimes we tend to want to resolve every problem immediately and we just can't do it. So we need to look at things long, long term, we need to strategize in the long term um, and small access to start with can be the starting point that we need. 
Um, I think also using other agencies as often as we can. Geneva Call have a different role to the, the role that many of us play as protection actors. ICRC, IFRC, MSF, who's best situated to help us get some protection access? So we need to be asking ourselves that I feel very privileged as a BROCAP because we move between the cultures of the different agencies and we get to understand them. So we need to understand which agency, which culture of within which agency will best suit the circumstances where we find ourselves. I guess the uh, final point that I'd like to make is that we should be reluctant to give up early. Um, we need to test the authorities because circumstances are often changing. The uh, dynamics of our office change, the dynamics of the UN, of the NGOs, of the, the government, of the various people we are negotiating with. So we need to be careful to continue to analyse and to test what's going on. And there might not be an opportunity today, but a week or two later opportunities might start to arise. So they're the, uh, the key points that I'd, uh, I think are important when we look at um, trying to negotiate access for protection actors. Excellent, Paul. Thank you so much. And uh, as you know, we, we asked participants to provide concrete examples uh, of this particular kind of challenge. We've received a number of, of really excellent ones. I'd like to uh, actually read out a few of them. Uh, here and um, and ask Paul to to provide his reflections on these specific examples. Uh, if a practitioner came to you uh, with this issue, uh, what reflections you might have for him or her? Understanding, of course, that there's no right answer. Uh, these are all really really difficult situations, difficult questions. And I'd also like to invite any of the other uh, panelists to indicate if they'd like to jump in as well. So, first example. This comes uh, from an INGO, someone working with an INGO in Nigeria who writes, an armed conflict context in northwestern Nigeria resulted in a mass population displacement with increasing vulnerabilities. Several cases of sexual and gender-based violence were reported, as well as children being sent out at an early age in the Almagiri system with immense protection needs. During access negotiations, it was made clear that this, these occurrences are cultural and a ban was placed on speaking up. However, nutrition and pediatric interventions were welcomed, as well as acceptance of medical care for survivors of SGBV. Uh, over to you, Paul. Any reflections on, on this specific situation? Well, that sounds to me like a situation where we do need to take a long-term view um, I believe the system's been in place for years and years and years. So we can't expect to just turn it over because we are there. So it's a matter of uh, finding out what, what we could do. But we need to do that by taking a long-term view. And we must build on what, what's there. So in other words, if we do this for... Um, nutrition and pediatric interventions, then that's our starting point. We need to make sure that our colleagues working in those uh, areas are familiar with protection. They want to know where we want to move on these issues. And similarly with uh, GVB, that means we're going to create a network. So we need to basically identify networks, identify opportunities to take the system further but look at it from a long-term perspective. That might mean we need to be talking with our development partners as well, because as humanitarians, we may not be there for a long period of time. So we need to be setting the scene and setting up the system so that we can um, make some moves. Another key thing from my perspective is always trying to identify just a couple of people within the system, uh, perhaps within the government, within the military, within the police force, who may be interested in pursuing this. You might get a, a no from some of the senior people, but you might find some people who are um, interested in working on the issue with you. Uh, they might be lower level civil servants, 
but I think it's important to try and identify your friends in this situation, people that you can work with over a long period of time. So there'd be just a few okay. suggestions from my side. Terrific. Thank you so much, Paul. I'd like to turn over to Hisham. Did you want to come in on this one? Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's more on the on the actual theme, uh, authorities to favor assistance uh, mm -hmm. rather than protection when we do an intervention. I think I just wanted to make a couple of remarks just based on my on on my experience. Um, I think we have uh, here. There is a, it's a two side issue. There is the issue from the authorities that of course always favor having material in kind. Uh, things to be given ra rather than uh, dialogue or discussion that can be embarrassing for them or be putting them under under pressure. And here is authorities, uh, they can be official ones or uh, non-state armed groups. I mean, at the end of the day, he, anyone who is controlling an area or a population uh, rather favor something concrete than just a discussion on uh, on respect of uh, of human rights or humanitarian law. But however, what I wanted to add is that is as well something from our side as humanitarians, uh, because um, most of the time we internalize these challenges. And we basically accept the fact, uh, without sometimes even trying, uh, we accept the fact that uh, authorities or actors in charge would rather accept first assistance, then it will be easier to speak about protection. And I think it's wrong. Uh, and from what I, from what I had experience, it does not work. Uh, it's, it's not because you give something today that the next day you can speak about GBV. Um, so we have as well ourselves internally to reflect on, uh, to make sure that either it comes together, protection and assistance, or we speak about protection because protection is the basis. I mean, if we increase the respect of people during conflict, then we reduce the need for further uh, intervention in terms of assistance. So I just wanted to say that it's important as well to look at um, ourselves internally and as well sometimes to, um, um, to, uh, to perceive the fact that sometimes we don't put ourselves in the position of speaking about protection first. And I believe we get the authorities uh, to be used basically to this system. So yeah, we just have to be careful. And I think one of the pot potential solutions could, as Paul was saying, uh, strengthen just coordination prior to intervention in specific uh, uh, area between the various actors on the ground, the pure protection actors like Geneva Call or Civic or any other ones, or the, the mixed ones like ICRC, UN and so on, or the pure assistance ones like the WFP or MSF. I think it's important because uh, if we are, let's say, uh, harmonized together, then it will be easier than to, to, to deal with the issue when we come to, to meet the authorities, uh, whoever they are. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Hishan. That was very helpful indeed. I'd like to jump over as well to Tiffany uh, on this. Over to you, Tiffany. Great, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this specific example. And what really stood out for me uh, is the sentence uh, that says, during access negotiation, it was made clear that the, the, these occurrences, these occurrences are cultural. And I think that that's a really common thing that we run into is, is cultural being the explanation in a positive spin or the excuse in a more negative spin for, for what falls under um, our work as falls under our, our work around protection. Um, and, and what we would, would see as violence. And when I think about it from, uh, negotiating access is really recognizing what, what the motivation of access restrictions and that kind of response from local authorities, from local duty bearers, uh, from the local communities themselves is that recognizing that that is a, a motivating actor. And when we're external actors coming in, and what is perceived to be uh, an attack on an identity and an attack on a culture um, is, is going to draw a, a, a very negative and immediate response. And I think that the way that we talk about these things um, in, in a, a much more collaborative, uh, mutually respectful way can help open up that, that space. Uh, again, it can be a lot slower. Who you engage with, who are the people within the community who, who are uh, both respected as representatives of their culture, but also are re willing to be 
change agents around violence, I think is, is, a, is an, a helpful way. It can be helpful. None of these things will work in all situations, of course. Uh, but I really think that issue around cultural practices is something that is very common across, across protection work. Great. Thank you, Tiffany, for drawing that out. Indeed, a very important um, uh, aspect of, of that example. So I'm, I'm glad that you were able to come in on that. I think we have time for a couple of additional examples uh, on this theme. Um, we have another. This came in from one of today's uh, participants who's working with an INGO in Bangladesh. And, uh, and she writes, in Bangladesh, approval of a project in the Rohingya camps was first denied and then severely delayed because it contained protection and education measures. Government wanted to restrict service provision to a few agencies only, despite the huge need in the camps. There was an inherent threat that none of our uh, other non-protection projects would be approved in the future. Lengthy and continuous advocacy by local colleagues finally made it possible, but I don't know more specifics on how they achieved it. Um, back to you, Paul. Do you have any uh, reflections on, on this particular example coming out of Bangladesh? Well, I know it's a very difficult environment there. I've been on occasions, and I guess persistence is one thing that we need to um, just continually work with the authorities in in that part of Bangladesh because it's a, a complex system and um, a, a complex uh, issue uh, from their perspective. So I think we need to be persistent. Um, I guess the only other thing there is to try and use those who have the best access. So I remember when I was there, the NGO Islamic Relief were running some medical services and we tried to work closely with them because they seem to have a better relationship with uh, authorities than some of the others. So I think, again, it's a matter of trying to identify um, who is best positioned to try and advocate for your protection work. But uh, we, I think we need to be bold or Also, in some of these situations, that authorities um, think we need to, we get results by doing that. Um, but if we do want access, then we need to just uh, be persistent in our our approach. Great, right, thanks, Paul. And we have another Over. example. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another example. This is coming from a participant working in Tanzania. Um, this is from a, a few years back, from 2015, uh, working with an INGO in the Naduta camp in Tanzania, who writes, reports about harassment in the camp from uh, pro-Kurunziza uh, uh, supporters against r refugees who opposed him uh, were dismissed as rumors by Tanzanian authorities who refused to discuss this. Assistance was welcome protection concerns or mitigating measures about refugees who were escaping political violence in Burundi were not welcome. Um, back to you, Paul, with this, with this example. Any reflections? Well, I found that a very tricky situation to deal with. And um, again, I think it's a matter of how we analyze the situation and try and pinpoint where we might have most to be about refugees and UNHCR being the mandated refugee agency, I would probably be trying to put the pressure on UNHCR to take that up as an issue as strongly as they possibly can through their, their senior management. Um, it seemed to me to be a very uh, tricky political issue to deal with locally and it may be that pushing it up the line and to the mandated agency who has a uh, very clear responsibility for the protection of refugees might have been one way of going about that. But once uh, it, it can be very difficult if you're in the field and you're seen to be getting involved in, in the politics of a, a situation. So I would be trying to push that up to uh, um, UNHCR, but I'd welcome comments from the other colleagues who might have better ideas.
<laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, uh, any of you uh, do feel free to to uh, jump in or indicate uh, that you'd like to jump in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to to move on. We have one more example on on this theme before we uh, before we give you a rest, Paul. <laughs> uh, so this one is coming from DR Congo, again uh, from a participant working with an INGO there, who writes. The protection activities planned by my organization have been blocked by the provincial authorities one day before the activity implementation, despite previous engagement with authorities as well as information sharing. This resulted in the suspension of our mediation activities planned for a dialogue between breeders and farmers in conflict with expectations from both parts. The team is now trying to develop an advocacy strategy at the higher level to advocate for the implementation of their activities in the area. And I'm going first to Paul, but then, of course, uh, any other panelists who would like to jump in, uh, please do let us know. Over to you, Paul. Well, my thoughts on this one would be that um, it would be good if the breeders and farmers could somehow show their support. Um, so if they could be very much part of the advocacy strategy and try and take it to a higher level themselves um, or together with you, um, because again, it's a, it's a very tricky um, situation. Um, I think what's key is though that frustrating as this is, that we don't leave, that we continue to support the, uh, the concept and we continue to try and push um, I know it's very frustrating when you've done all the work, you've got everything prepared. I was involved in one myself where the government actually arrested our lawyers when we got them all to the second day of a meeting um, and destroyed our meeting that way. But I think we need to just persist and, um, uh, but to the extent possible, get uh, the, the participants to be advocating on their own behalf. Over. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul, and a very important message uh, indeed to leave us with as we move on to the next theme. Uh, so now we'll be looking at a different type of issue, what to do when discovering protection issues and then having to decide whether and how to advocate ourselves or, or to report on these issues, um, considering that this might affect our access. I'd like to turn to Tiffany on this. Tiffany, you have come across this type of issue a lot in your work, as I understand. What does this tend to look like in practice, in your experience, and what would be your general uh, recommendations to colleagues uh, on this kind of issue? Over to you, Tiffany. Great, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it is a, it's a struggle, and we all find ourselves bearing witness uh, to situations, um, sometimes collectively and sometimes really just one or two uh, organizations in very deep field locations um, and wondering what to do with the information that we have. Where, I mean, from where we tend to start this, this thinking in this, in this conversation is really around the, right at the outset, what, how does the framing of both protection and reporting sound to our counterparts in, in our local communities? There's sort of an inherent paternalistic nature to these words. Uh, a protection is sort of, you know, comes up with this, this visual of, of uh, being in, a, in a, an authority figure, an authority role to have more power than those who have less power to protect them from others. Uh, and we have that, that situation. So the way we talk about protection and, and really recognizing right from that beginning and then reporting um, is, is it has a very similar feeling to it where we are reporting on the behaviors of somebody else. And if we take it right back to the very personal, our own personal experiences of how we feel if somebody is reporting on our behaviors. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but one of the, the, the things that I find is most useful in protection work is really thinking about the, the core of it all being human dynamics, human relationships and interactions and, and understanding what those motivations are. So starting from that is really challenging ourselves to think about how we come across, um, particularly in, uh, those of us who are involved in, in, in human agencies and INGOs as the foreign presence in any given area. And then the next thing I think we really need to ask ourselves is why are we reporting and to whom? 
So there is a tendency in the humanitarian architecture to be a, uh, a closed loop within ourselves and we report to ourselves for various purposes. Sometimes that reporting is done really intentionally with, an, with a hope to change a certain circumstance. And often that is done for data collection, for sharing information, for preparing, for context analysis, for thinking about what's going forward. But what is the purpose of the reporting and is it necessary? Who are we reporting to and why? Before we are doing it, I think that there can be a tendency uh, in, the, in, in some protection programming that, uh, and, and we see this a lot around the language around monitoring, where it's being in an observer position and then reporting what you see uh, can come across, it, this is not always too certainly, but can be done in a quite a passive way. So we go into a situation, we, we observe something, and then we report to an external body about what we saw in there. So that is not a place to build trust with our local counterparts, whether they be the local authorities, the community members, state, non-state armed groups, and so on. So I think that, that we need to really challenge ourselves around that and have some discipline around how we, how we um, use information and what we're trying to achieve with it. I think the, the question about what has done, what, do we, what have we done before reporting? Where, why is the decision being made to report and what does that mean? And if we orient our protection work towards prevention, first and foremost. Our first role, the best protection, as we know, is prevention, preventing the violence from happening in the first place or being able to contribute towards interrupting it or stopping it. So we, we, we gain a lot more credibility and we are in a much stronger defendable position related to reporting if we can demonstrate actions that have done, been done long before that. Uh, where we have been working with the local duty bearers and perpetrators. And yes, sometimes those are the same groups and sometimes they are not. Um, and really raising concerns, sharing observations from a collaborative perspective. We've had, we, we tend to have a, a, a decent amount of success of really approaching the idea of civilian protection with local duty bearers and perpetrators as a mutual concern, a mutual, a mutual concern that we're collectively here concerned about this community and we would like to work together. Uh, if you build those relationships up and have that, that and if your first line of reporting, and I'll give an example of sort of badly behaved or aggressive soldiers on a checkpoint and, and we have been able to build a solid working relationship with the local military commander or militia commander, we can go directly to them and say, this is what we're observing. Um, would you be able to, to, to help and to, 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 to effect change in the behavior of those who are under your command? Um, and if that doesn't change, and if we have tried other things, then we are much in a much more defendable position uh, when we, our access might get challenged. We can say, well, we did try. Here's the things that we've, we've been working on um, and, and to be able to do that. And even when we go out of the local context, so fine, first, first line of defense is really working with the local actors uh, to try and prevent in the moment. If that's not working, it is much, much more comfortable for the humanitarian world, again, to report to itself than to report to the higher authorities related to those duty bearers and or perpetrators if they are different groups. And so prior to, uh, if, if it's possible, and again, not always possible, depending on the relationship, but in some, some places it can be, uh, where you would go into the either state capital, provincial capital, or national capital, and work your way up through the authority lines on that front prior then, then to going from a more punitive approach, which is reporting into the humanitarian community, the diplomatic community, so on and so forth. Another aspect that I think that can be very helpful is recognizing, again, going back to that real paternalistic nature, um, uh, uh, the vibe around reporting, is if we focus on amplifying the voices of those who are being directly impacted by the violence. Working with, with communities, those who are being directly impacted, who want to actually directly report what's happening to them themselves. Uh, and so if we can look at it from a, an amplifying the local voice, leverage our good offices, leverage the existing relationships that we have within the authority structures uh, and barring success in that area with the, with the foreign structures, humanitarian and otherwise, 
uh, and encourage those who are most affected to be able to, to use their own voices and say their 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 concerns directly, recognizing that that can come at an increased vulnerability. Not everybody is going to want to be able to do that. And that is, again, there is no singular solution for any of these very complex problems, but it can be quite effective. It is also incredibly empowering and much more accurate uh, for those most affected to be able to speak on themselves. And as protection actors, we can orient our actual protection activities then to be working on ensuring and, uh, and reducing the risk to those people who are willing to stand up and use their own voices through tactics like protective accompaniment and strategic presence and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, as, and then ultimately we come down to the point where sometimes we do have to accept, we have to make those very tough decisions and accept that sometimes our access will get restricted. Sometimes it's temporary uh, and sometimes it, it can be more permanent. And those are, are, are very uh, difficult decisions to make. Uh, we've certainly run across that multiple times um, where we say, well, if we say anything, you know, we compromise our ability to remain here, but we have literally tried everything in our wheelhouse. And the communities that are impacted are also supporting that they want this messaging to get out and to whom. Uh, and then it's a much more collaborative approach. We have to be very careful about sort of internal discipline and around information sharing. I can think of an example where we were working in a camp. Um, our team in the camp had some concerns. Uh, there was there was a military presence and had concerns about what was happening there uh, in terms of aggressions on civilians. Reported it to our country office, who then uh, reported it into other protection colleagues to the protection cluster. As part of a context analysis conversation, it inadvertently got swept up into a protection report. And what had had should have been a, a more disciplined internal conversation on our end because our colleagues in the field. Um, should have been speaking to that camp commander first and foremost. And so we have to go back and, and, and make the apologies and, and do the work there accordingly. And, and to, so we had to accept um, some challenges. And then sometimes you have to say there's no other option. We need to get this information out um, and do it uh, from, from that perspective. I mean, I think from the, there's the, the, the requirement for sort of creativity and adaptability uh, in protection work is, is uh, extraordinary. And that certainly um, uh, is, is very clear for me as it relates to reporting that there is no singular approach to this. But I, I think from a mitigation perspective is that reporting should be seen as a, a tool uh, for, for direct protection, for, for violence interruption, for immediate concerns um, about people's, people's safety and security rather than an activity in and of itself for the sake of data collection. I'll leave it there for the moment. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, now, if I may, we do also have a couple of examples that have been submitted by participants on this type of issue. So I'll toss those uh, over to you, Tiffany. I'll, I'll just read them out. And again, uh, any other panelists wishing to come in, just let us know. Example number one, this is a Again, someone working with an INGO, uh, and they're working in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they write, within the current operation, we have experienced temporary suspension of the outreach activities uh, targeting the affected population sleeping rough outside the official reception facilities as a consequence to observing and reporting rights violations and excessive use of force by the authorities. Negotiations were required to ensure continuation of activities. Um, do you have any reflections, Tiffany, on, on this situation from Bosnia and Herzegovina? Yeah, I imagine that that was probably a really difficult choice that the, the INGO made about having to report it and to whom, and, and, and uh, they weighed the risk and the benefit of, according to do so. What stands out for me is, is sort of two things. One is the, the word temporary. There was a temporary suspension, and sometimes when we are making those decisions, as I was saying, that we know um, might might risk our access in exchange for for what we think will be a greater good. Uh, sometimes that is, you know, access is not a, a, a complete and finite process. It's, it's it's fluid. So the fact that it's temporary, I think, is great. And I would say congratulations that the the negotiations um, were able to to bring about 
continuity of, of activities. And I think Paul made some good comments about that, about uh, putting things in perspective in terms of accepting wins and losses and, and small versions of access when we can get it. Um, and and to, to to be willing uh, to accept that that sometimes we have to go back to the drawing board and sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes we do it for the right reason and we would do it again if we needed to. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, and I'm I'm sure it's very helpful to have uh, to have those reflections for the listener who who um, who submitted that example. We have another. This comes from a participant working with an INGO in South Sudan who writes, we were in an area to do a nutrition assessment. We noticed that there were a lot of child marriages, and so we flagged it, and we also inquired from the authorities. They, however, quote, advised us that if we want to work there, we should not interfere with the culture of the people and that they should be allowed to be. We hence brought it up with the field inter-NGO meeting, and the group decided to refer the matter to the organization mandated to address protection concerns. Uh, is this a type of situation that you've come across, Tiffany, in terms of access and protection outcomes? And what do you think about having a single mandated protection agency take it on rather than a coordinated effort of all of the organizations on the ground there? Back to you, Tiffany. Great, yeah. I mean, certainly, and yes, we've run across situations like that, and, and working for Nonviolent Peace Force, we, we only work on protection, so we are, we are a single mandated organization in that sense. Um, I mean, I would say that, uh, A, the, the, the culture comes up again, and so my comments from the, from the previous section are echoed here again, and I think that is, is from this very, reflecting on the specific example, is a really important, uh, starting place, and, and really challenging ourselves to look at both short and longer term work. And so, and what is the priorita prioritization of needs? Um, we can come to short-term mutual agreements on direct protection with local authorities uh, more easily, uh, and things related to, you know, direct. Uh, uh, you know, Paul referred to the work the WFP has been doing, uh, uh, you know, direct violence that happens in and around distributions um, that can happen in those situations. What happens in, for communities who are caught in, con in contested territory, so on and so forth. Uh, direct protection and prevention of, about sexual assault. It, it, direct protection from children being um, harmed uh, and, and so on and so forth as a short-term agreement to, to build relationships and build trust. So as a starting place, that, that hierarchy of needs, preventing violence in the moment, uh, I would say starting there. And then something like uh, early marriage, child marriage, is a, is a much longer, uh, more challenging thing to, to get involved. Certainly, we all know for the people involved in what's happening today, that doesn't feel true. But we have to be quite realistic about where we can affect change. Um, and so building trust. And, and, and working with the relationships and again going back to the primacy of the local actors and really being oriented to what what brings about successful sustainable change is the change that is, is initiated from within. So if you're working in a community, you're able to build up sort of community agreement that violence should not be uh, the default approach to conflict management and conflict prevention. Uh, and then what is violence and that there's the very obvious overt types of violence and then what is maybe less, less easily recognized, um, uh, at different times of more subtle violence. And then are there people within that community who are both respected as representatives of that culture who are, uh, also very worried about this particular issue? And we, I mean, in South Sudan, certainly as, as an example, have found that, you know, certainly a lot of men and women, but predominantly women in communities that we work with are very worried about early marriage, um, keeping their girls in school, so on and so forth. So we've been able to orient towards them taking the lead on that issue. Uh, so with a locally owned, locally, locally driven prospect, I think where, I mean, collaborative and, and coordinated is always what we should be doing. Um, and sometimes it's, it's usually coming in for a short-term humanitarian response and somebody has, has the ability to um, engage in longer-term programming, in this case perhaps an organization that's really just focusing on protection work, then that, that is also fine. We can be mutually reinforcing to one another. Great. Thanks so much, Tiffany. We have a few questions coming in to, to follow up on some of the points you've been raising, but I think we'll try to come back to those at the end after we get through the uh, the next two themes. So we'll come back for a, a round of Q&A. We've also had a few questions come in for Paul. Um, 
So for now, let's, uh, let's move on to the next type of issue that we'll be discussing in today's webinar, when there is access but the authorities or the armed group do not let the humanitarian actor deliver freely on their own, but rather restrict which channels that the assistance and protection can go through. Now, before looking at some of the examples that we've received from participants uh, about this type of challenge, I'd like to turn uh, first to our panel and specifically to Hishem. Have you seen this type of situation in practice, Hishem, and do you have any general recommendations to share with the group on this kind of issue? Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, indeed, uh, I think we all seen this uh, this situation happening uh, in the field, uh, and as you said rightly, it's both from uh, state authorities, uh, be it at the national level or at more, let's say, local level, or from the armed groups themselves. Anyone who is in position of authority wants, of course, to control what's come in and come out uh, from the from the area they control. Um, I think first to start with, there's nothing wrong against uh, <clears throat> any type of authority uh, asking or let's say controlling or just making sure that what is being provided uh, doesn't really make sense or is not uh, against uh, the very national law. So we will not talk about uh, completely, uh, let's say, uh, unlimited access to every everyone. But here what is very important is that is only through the channel that there is the control uh, of the, let's say, um, uh, provision of assistance and protection and control, and then it comes to basically uh, choosing to which type of communities we will provide these uh, services or to which areas at which time of the year and so on. And I think I will come back to basically the uh, the humanitarian principles. At the end of the day, as uh, uh, humanitarian actors, uh, we are bound by humanitarian principles, meaning neutrality uh, and impartiality. Um, and I think this is very, very much important. I mean, we want to make sure that whatever we do is done in accordance to these to this, to this principles. So I believe in in reality, on the ground, you will always uh, be asked uh, by any authority why you don't use this particular channel, why you don't go through this particular body, it's much better for you. And uh, I think, yes, on the ground, it's a matter for me of, uh, of a check and balance. I mean, if I go through this particular channel, does it impact negatively uh, my neutrality and my neutrality as an, an actor and the impartiality of the assistance or protection delivery? Basically, would I be able to reach uh, correctly the ones that need this protection and assistance? Especially, it's very important to know that we have to do the, the assessment um, from from every angle, not only that we are able to provide these services, but as well when the assistance or protection is provided, that there is no, let's say, uh, bad situation happening to the, to the people who receive the assistance or protection afterwards, basically when we leave. Uh, sometimes we can provide the way we want, and then when we leave, we have like authorities coming back to the very person that were assisted, and then we have, uh, let's say, uh, act of revenge or reprisals or looting and so on. So we have to be very, very careful. I would say um, we have to be very careful as making sure that whatever we do is in line with uh, the humanitarian principles, and then secondly, that the duty of care their principle is very much implemented and respected, and uh, this for us should frame uh, the way we are we are we are we are seeking access. Um, we have to be careful. I mean, we, we are dealing with states or armed groups that are extremely sensitive uh, whenever we uh, we come into a specific area, and and I understand. I mean, I mean, uh, coming from our own country, uh, our own very country uh, will not accept uh, anyone coming in. So this we have as well to understand the, the realities. But when it's for humanitarian purpose, I think it's extremely important that we are really bound by the true criteria that, that uh, I just mentioned. So this is for me on the, my first point is really on the, on the framework. So to establish uh, in advance uh, a solid framework based on principles and then the, the duty of care. 
the second point is, of course, to to make sure that authorities, be it from both armed groups or states, understand and respect these principles and then this, this duty of care. Sometimes we take it for granted that because we're coming, because we, any organization, and I spoke when I was with ICRC, who is very big, or any other organization, we should, we are entitled to do it, and then you authorities, whoever you are, you should know about it. No, there is a long preparatory work to do in the sense of raising awareness uh, about this principle, raising awareness about the importance of being able to provide uh, uh, provision of services uh, without, uh, let's say, restrictions. So there is a lot of, let's say, groundwork to be done at various levels. So this is my second point, is first of all, to identify who should, who should we talk to, um, to basically give this awareness. And it's not only to the, let's say, the natural uh, services. It can be sometimes intelligence actors, defense, uh, maybe businessmen. We have to do like a solid mapping uh, to make sure that we talk to the right people and they understand. They need to be champions of our work. Uh, I think this is a, this is my this is the point I believe on the on the awareness. And then my the next point is uh, again on our side. I mean I'm I'm uh, I'm really insisting on our own accountability as humanitarians. Uh, and here I speak about the way we behave. Judge Geneva Cole, we did um, uh, a paper a couple of years ago where we interviewed 25 armed groups with whom we have dialogue with, and we asked them, how do you view humanitarian action? How do you view, let's say, uh, uh, the way we, we, we assist for protection? And they say, you do it as long as you respect principles, as long as you don't do double standards, as long as you don't mix politics and then uh, humanitarian. So, from our side as well, we have as well to walk the talk, um, I would say, and be very careful in the way we present ourselves in keeping strictly humanitarian principles, uh, even in the way we communicate. So we basically make sure that whatever we we say, we do it on the ground. Um, so we may come to, we, of course, we come on a daily basis with these type of challenges, but uh, and I will finish that. If we try to implement a little bit the solid framework, uh, the uh, raising awareness, and then ourselves being able to, to let's say, be uh, be clear on on our principles, and that it's from the top of the organizations to the to the more field level, everyone is basically saying the same thing and acting the same way. Then I believe that we could overcome this, uh, these challenges. Uh, I will stop here and I will answer questions if any. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, we do have some uh, some questions coming in, but first I would, uh, we also have received a number of uh, good examples related to the theme that you've just been discussing, so I'd like to, to raise those and get your thoughts on those, Hisham. Uh, the first example, this is um, coming from someone working with a UN agency in Tanzania, uh, writing uh, about the concern um, the, uh, about the insistence that humanitarian agencies work with selected partners or actors on the ground. So uh, what this person is witnessing is that um, humanitarian agencies are not allowed to engage with the ministry or the, the authority responsible for health, for example, but only with the ministry in charge of refugees and wanting to make sure uh, everything is done through uh, a specific ministry rather than allowing the humanitarian agencies to work directly uh, with the uh, with the governmental authorities um, involved in, in specific issues such as health. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, over to you, Hisham. Is this a, a kind of situation that you're familiar with? And what would be your reflections uh, for the person writing in concerned about uh, these kinds of restrictions about who humanitarian agencies can work with, especially from the, um, the local government or uh, uh, from the local government side? Over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, I mean, this is a very valid example, and unfortunately, it's, it's often the case uh, at the state level, uh, uh, there is one ministry which is designated to coordinate all human actors' efforts, 
and they say that it's just for sake of better coordination and streamlining, but of course it's just to control and then to put aside relevant ministries to work together with the, with the, with the agencies or, or NGOs. I think here there is, we have to understand why they act this way. Uh, there is a fear of losing control, basically. There is a fear of losing control. So we have to understand the fear. We have to understand what is the rationale behind that and then try to mitigate it, but not being seen as going against it for the sake of going against it. So one of the possibilities that, I mean, one of the things that was done, and I remember that I did it in Somalia, that it was basically more or less the, the same example, is to, to try in the raising awareness more at the bilateral level, maybe using a bit the high level of your organizations trying to convince, to say that while we respect the, the particular ministry to be the, the central coordinator, but if all the uh, actors could be just maybe contributing, could be partnering, could be, uh, could be just providing their technical inputs, of course, under the, um, the global umbrella of the coordinating ministry. And uh, I think this is, it's, it's one of the, of the things that worked at least at that time. I don't say that is maybe that's uh, uh, the solution for, for everything, but by trying to answer uh, to the fear of some of some actors by losing control by telling them no you don't lose control you're still in charge we just want you please could you invite this and that because they have technical expertise and it would help and we will be responsible as well to make sure that we update you on what we do and so on and so on and um, and this is something that that that, that could be could, could be possible uh, of course if um, the, mini the, the particular ministry is totally blocking and is endangering basically uh, life or populations to be served and so on. Here, of course, we need to go a step further and maybe have a denunciation so on and, and, and go a bit higher in the, in the pressure. But most of the time, uh, it's dealt with uh, at, uh, it's dealt at bilateral level by understanding as well uh, why they act this way. Thank you. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, another example, this is coming from an individual working with an INGO in South Sudan who writes, in South Sudan, which was divided into rebel and controlled areas, we were based in the rebel territory. Our activities were, however, to take place in both areas. While in the rebel area, we would face an extremely arduous task to be cleared to leave the rebel area. The sheer number of different levels of authorities that would need to stamp the clearance letter was hampering our access. Many times we failed to deliver services because one commander on that specific day had traveled, wasn't present. Um, so tossing this back to you again, Hishem, uh, is this, is this a kind of example that you witnessed and, and what would be your, uh, what would be your thoughts for this individual working in South Sudan? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, we are, we are, we are dealing with this Geneva call as we work, of course, directly with armed groups and, uh, this, this situation happens a lot. I mean, this is linked, I would say, in the, in the structuring of, of armed groups. Uh, they are usually not really organized. I mean, it depends. Some of them are extremely organized, but, for, for let's say uh, a lot of them are not really organized and everyone is basically saying that they are the guys in charge and usually when the person is not here on the day then everything is blocked it's basically a poor command and control of the of the of the very armed group um, and then you have of course let's say uh, divide within the armed groups uh, uh, rivalries as well which which we really, let's say which increases uh, this these difficulties. Um, I would give an example on how Geneva Call basically we try to overcome this in, a, in an other context in the DRC, um, where we have as well a multiplicity of, uh, of, of armed groups and command and control. Here we basically sat together with, with the leaders of the armed groups, with some, lead, with some community leaders as well, and we put it on the table, let's say, this, this, this very issue. Basically, uh, how we can get the famous letters, green lights, when you are not here, when you are not there, as they're traveling a lot. And basically, we identified uh, focal points, basically specific focal points with one focal point, and if, if the person is not there, who is the one in charge? And then we have basically a kind of an organigram, 
uh, that is that was validated by the armed group leader and i will come back to this point it's very important and at the end of the day when everyone agreed on that basically it was it was easier because uh, everyone knew that if a is not here because he's traveling that day then b has responsibility over that and it is basically the communication and decisions taking uh, however for this particular example it's very important that you involve the top leadership. If you organize this at the technical level, it won't work because everyone is scared of taking decisions because of the, let's say, uh, fluid structure of, uh, of armed groups entities. So it's a matter as well. Once again, I, I come back to the, to, to the point of understanding with whom we are talking to, understanding what are their reality on the ground. Sometimes they don't do it on purpose. Sometimes they are just completely disorganized. So what can we propose to support as well? What can we propose to, to, to make, let's say, uh, to, to create a system when, when there is no system? Uh, so yeah, this was the one, this is one uh, mitigation measure that we developed for this particular example. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. And great to hear the examples that you're able to bring in as well. I think that really helps to be able to see uh, the similarities, the commonalities from one context to another with some of these challenging issues. So thanks so much for that. Um, we're going to do one more quick example, if I may, Hisham. And um, I do have a couple of questions for you as well, uh, but we'll save those for the very end for the quick Q&A round. This third example uh, comes from someone working in the Pacific. So writes, the organization I work with in the Pacific was at times denied direct access to communities. Aid had to be channeled through the village chief for him to distribute uh, as he saw fit. It took considerable time to negotiate alternatives and enable access to assess specific needs. Um, over to you, Hisham, for, for any uh, brief reflections on this example coming from the Pacific region. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, this is a great example, and it's basically another facet of the, of the or another less unknown of the equation is uh, now at the traditional level. Basically, we come back to the to the very idea of who has who, who has authority and who exerts this authority. And usually, in a, in very in many situations, when you, when you don't have a rule of law system which is really let's say robust, then basically the one in charge controls what's coming and to whom is going there. I think here in the example, it's, they basically explain the way they mitigate it and. It's true, it takes time to negotiate alternatives to allow access. And uh, it's all about uh, sitting with the person. I, I think, I, I, I don't know for this example if they succeeded to, to, uh, to achieve uh, their objectives, but it's really by just understanding why the chief, why the village chief wanted to, uh, to channel, to, to go through it. Was he afraid of uh, diverted assistance that was, done, that was maybe the case uh, by, from other organizations in the past? Uh, was he afraid of like other issues that we really don't know that may be objective and and this we understand and we try to work on to work uh, to go through with them or is it really for their for his own business and here is once again I come back to the raising awareness and being clear before even we we engage into any activity with uh, with the community leader that this is the way we work basically we work uh, without discrimination we work according to objective criteria and of course we will include the chief in this uh, in this work and uh, several times I mean I, I met organizations that don't understand, uh, let's say, the local structures. I mean, uh, don't understand why the chief would be in charge because from, maybe from their own countries, uh, they don't have the, the structure. I mean, a lot of Western you, you, countries, you, you don't have any more like village chiefs and so on, or let's say traditional leaders. But the vast majority of the world, you still have these authorities. So it's extremely important that we understand the internal structures and, and, and the importance of this particular person. So it was possible that maybe this was not taken into account in the analysis. So um, I, my point here is once again to understand exactly how the structure works, why this chief is so important, why he wants this or that. If you, can we accommodate when it's not, let's say, interfering with our humanitarian principles and, and, uh, and the duty of care? 
and then take the time, take the time to understand, to explain, and it's rather, it's, it may be sometimes better to delay a little bit uh, than to just rush in and then uh, regret it um, afterwards. Because it's harder to change when something is done than, than to, to do it directly. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Hisham. Really highlighting one of the fundamental concepts that's so important to negotiations of all types, really understanding where your counterpart is coming from. Uh, very helpful indeed. Thank you so much. We're going to move uh, now to the fourth and final issue that we're examining today. We'll look at a couple of examples and then we're going to uh, move on to a brief Q&A round. So we've already looked at access negotiations and protection from a few different angles, but I'd like to next focus on the specific issue of restrictions on needs assessments, in particular when they cannot include protection. I'll turn to Jochen. Uh, what would be your recommendations, generally speaking, in this type of situation, with restrictions on needs assessment, what can be assessed during the needs assessment? Over to you, Jochen. Thank you very much. Um, maybe first of all, uh, to start, um, in my experience, it's often that, um, in, in restrictive operational environments, you have already constraints on assessments in general. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, um, you, you often see that protection, protection assessments as part of, of overall needs assessments um, face, face additional constraints. Um, and, of course, these, these constraints um, for, for assessments will, will vary greatly depending on, um, on the context on where you try to, to run these assessments. Um, and so that goes along um, as well with uh, uh, with constraints in in the implementation of the programming. So I don't think we can we can actually um, just talk about the assessment uh, regarding pro uh, protection, but then this will of course also have um, implications on the implementation of uh, of protection programming if we if we can't even do the uh, do the assessment um, around these uh, these programmings. Um, uh, but I think what is um, what is important to um, to look at is um, first of all, and that goes uh, back what um, Hijam said, is actually to understand um, what triggers the the authorities to to block certain assessments um, and especially the um, protection assessments. And um, so, so go back, have have these conversations. Um, with uh, with the authorities, with the armed group, with the de facto authorities, um, um, the tribal chiefs, depending whoever whoever is in charge, um, and of course these conversations should be part of like a, a long term engagement. And I think like one one important point I wanted to make is that I mean access negotiations, be it for protection or for other humanitarian uh, um, operations. Um, is a process, so it's not a a, a one-off conversation you have. It's a, it's a long-term process um, uh, where we we slowly start um, to um, to explain our roles, the the programming and assessments as well. So as part of that, um, I think it's important to unpack protection activities because what I've seen is that depending on where you work and the context, um, that there's a a, mis a great misunderstanding of what protection means and what protection does. Um, on the on the sides of the authorities. So if we unpack uh, what we actually want to look at in terms of assessments and then subsequently um, in programming, this certainly can help um, um, the understanding and can certainly help um, the the negotiations and the engagements going forward. Um, and so and then also try to understand what are the underlying issues, sensitivities, and the interests. Um, around then blocking certain parts of like protection questions within an assessment and, um, and protection programming. And uh, most of it is, has already been mentioned. Um, but I think the, the top three I have experienced is either related to what they often define as cultural sensitivities. We had that in the first example. Um, what comes up a, up a lot as well is that um, in, related to potential military uh, activities, so the authorities, for example, are concerned that um, assessments in general, but especially protection assessments, are tools to, to spy on, on military movements, um, front lines, and so forth. And then, of course, um, uh, related to, uh, to control, power, 
um, and the interest of the respective actors. So if we understand that, then we can, in our conversation, we can at least start uh, um, mitigating some of the concerns um, of the of the stakeholder of the party um, we're we're engaging with. Um, so, I mean, this might help, and like ideally, we would get um, um, an agreement on the protection um, um, assessment as part of an overall assessment or as a protection assessment itself. However, in reality, um, uh, it, it's most likely um, a longer-term um, um, negotiation and engagement where step by step we're getting um, uh, more parts of like protection questionnaires and protection um, assessments. And protection teams into certain areas um, to um, to uh, to gather this information. Um, then, um, depending on the context as well, I think my my second point will be um, it often is a matter of uh, um, uh, operational modalities. So I mean I think it's uh, it, it's quite a different for for the authorities as well. If you if you go in um, and um, ask questions within the community, um, especially in areas which might be closer to to, um, to active fighting or front lines where there is already uh, some concern about information gathering and sharing, so uh, to look at uh, creative and alternative ways while negotiations are ongoing, of course, um, to gather the the information which uh, which we require. And then, of course, without putting um, the community um, at risk, and but also like keeping in mind um, uh, that um, if we're not transparent about what we're doing, it will certainly have an impact on on the overall access, and that's something we need to we need to look very closely at as well. Um, but in general, to integrate protection partners into 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 uh, assessments. But our protection colleagues would uh, use observational tools. So that's um, that's happening in a couple of countries. That's currently happening in Yemen um, because of like blockage of, of protection assessments, but not just protection assessments, assessments in general. Um, so then concerns which we'll find from these uh, from these assessments or concerns around uh, not being able to do these assessments can be addressed with the authorities. Um, uh, when we then discuss uh, the actual implementation, and so then, so whereby the protection should be part of it and not uh, and not excluded. Um, however, um, so it's much easier to have it part of it than like a protection um, um, implementation in certain contexts. So integrate integrate it into like the overall response. Um, then what was mentioned in examples here as well is that um, assessments to go through local partners. So um, that is being done, of course, um, and um, at times that might be that might be very helpful and might might solve the problem partly. Um, however, there are also a couple of risks associated with that. Um, partners might be influenced or close to um, the non-state armed group. Um, in the area they're operating in, the authorities, the de facto authorities, they might be under pressure um, by these authorities. Um, so that might put the partner um, at risk um, as well as um, the community um, and um, then potentially, and of course, the programming then um, in, the long, in the long run uh, as well. And what we've seen as well um, is um, when we look at protection activities, and when it comes to the assessments around it, uh, to rename um, the activity um, itself, um, which has solved some of the issues or eased the tension um, of the authorities, and that will be a process uh, while unpacking it. So, uh, lastly, I just wanted to uh, to, to to mention that, um, of course. Um, but what is important during this whole process um, is to keep in mind that um, that we need to be transparent uh, while we're doing what we're doing, um, because in the worst case scenario, if we're not, and we've seen that as well, um, then um, then this could have potential significant implications um, on the community, on the partner, as well as on the on on the overall uh, on the overall axis. So absolute transparency in the negotiations and um, 
and the operational modalities um, uh, moving forward. Um, and um, also keeping in mind that especially in restrictive environments, uh, even if we do have uh, an agreement to move forward uh, with the assessments, that uh, we might be monitored while doing these assessments, and we might still be putting um, um, communities, uh, communities and the partner um, at risk. So that's something um, to um, uh, to keep in mind. Um, so um, th I think there are several, depending on, on the context, there are several options moving it forward. But of course, um, all in all, what we need to look at is a is a understanding understanding the interest and the needs of the stakeholders and the fears of the stakeholders as well. Uh, unpack that, uh, try to find a solution around that, and understand this entire process as a full time job um, rather than a one off conversation. Um, because I mean, sometimes it takes it takes months, sometimes it takes weeks, and sometimes it, uh, it takes years. And we always tend to look at um, like access as a snapshot rather than than a, like a long term process. And uh, we're also all of us mainly just based in certain locations, um, um, often for for a relatively short time, and so we might not have the institutional knowledge or the history of like uh, negotiations in the past. Um, uh, so I mean, patience is required for that, and understanding of uh, um, of the actors in order. Uh, in order to to move it forward and 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 find solutions, um, thank you very much um, at this stage. Thank you, Jochen. Really appreciate the the practical perspective that you bring uh, to the discussion, even at that general level. Level, it's it's very helpful. Um, I think you were already uh, referencing one of the examples uh, that came in that you that you saw just before the event. Um, um, I'd like to read it out just to share uh, to share with the whole group. Um, that was an example coming from Ukraine, someone working with an INGO there, writing that the de facto authority does not let assessments be conducted directly uh, to bene beneficiaries. They need to be done via local NGOs, as, as you mentioned, Joachim, that are connected to the authority. If assessments are to be done officially, uh, Officially not the case, but the authority is present, and that, of course, uh, will influence uh, how needs and concerns are addressed. I won't ask you to um, to uh, reflect further uh, further now because I think you already did incorporate it, that into your um, your general comments. But just to share uh, with the other participants the specific example um, that we were dealing with from Ukraine. I would like, though, to um, to ask you if you have any further reflections on this example from Yemen. This came from an individual working with a UN agency there. I think you may have um, uh, briefly alluded to the situation and the difficulties there. Uh, but let's hear what this particular person writes. Authorities um, are checking the assessment forms, this is in Yemen, and they don't accept them if they include protection questions. In addition, they don't allow any partner to conduct assessments alone or to use unauthorized assessment forms. Um, any further reflections, Joachim, on this specific challenge in Yemen? Back to you. Um, thank you very much. I mean, um, I mean, it's a great example. One of, it's, of course, it's correct. Um, but I, I guess just to say that in, in more general terms, that um, I think what I've seen is that um, when protection is severely constrained or protection assessments and protection implementation is severely constrained, then we also see um, a, a more restricted or constrained operational environment. So now you could rank countries according according to that. So the more restrictive your environment, the more likely that um, protection will be restricted as well. So it's not just, I guess what I'm saying, it's not just protection um, itself. Like in the example of Yemen, for example, it's not just protection questions. So you can't do assessments uh, at all whatsoever, um, and protection conversations around protection um, are 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 even more difficult than conversations about um, other humanitarian um, um, operations. Um, so I mean, just to say, and again, that goes back, I think, to to what was mentioned before as well. Um, to understand where try to understand and entangle where the authorities are coming from, what is their concern and their fear, how can we unpack that, um, and how can we um, ensure 
um, that we at least mitigate their fear at the same time, ensure that um, our response um, um, remains principled and that we're not, and I think that's important as well, that we're not uh, dropping protection um, from these conversations, but finding creative ways in order to, to, to include it um, while keeping in mind uh, the risks of like hampering um, um, the overall the overall access. I think that would be my my uh, my feedback to that. Over. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jochen. We're going to move now to a quick round of Q and A. We've had some terrific questions coming in throughout the session. I'd like to turn first to Paul. This is a question that came in from uh, from Stephanie, who writes. Some humanitarian organizations change their top leadership uh, as routine after a couple of years. Uh, how huge is the sacrifice to give up well-established relationships with the key gatekeepers and local or national decision makers? Does this make sense if one does not uh, only want to bring in services but also work to change policies? Does it make sense to have this kind of rotation in top leadership every couple of years? Over to you, Paul. Okay, we may have uh, lost the connection with Paul. I'm going to try him again in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, I'll turn to Hisham. Um, here we have a question from Marta, who writes, I tend to agree with Hisham's point that the reflection must start internally to the organizations. I also wonder how much longer the protection assistance divide will prevail in light of the triple nexus. As Hisham said, there would be less need for assistance if protection issues were addressed, uh, then maybe the divide would actually be counterproductive. Um, Hisham, do you have any reflections on uh, on this potential trend, arguable trend, that, that potentially the, the clear divide, even as you articulated, between protection actors, uh, uh, mixed uh, protection and assistance actors, and peer assistance actors, how long will that actually last? Um, and uh, do you foresee um, that this uh, divide actually will become increasingly counterproductive or even non-existent? Back to you, Hisham. Thank you very much, and thanks for, for the question. It's a, it's a very valid question. Uh, it's true that over the years, um, I mean, the protection, let's say, sector has taken a, a blow. Uh, um, and I think it's, it's due to, of course, to, to many factors. One, one is the complexity of doing protection work. The second thing is what is protection, uh, just to start with, uh, just, I mean, uh, having a, a hard talk with an armed group, with an Islamist armed group on, uh, on, let's say, not attacking civilians is, is, is something that maybe fewer and fewer organizations uh, will do over time because of counter-legislation terrorism, because of their own safety because of lack of skills, because of just the fear, and as well because uh, they don't have the funds for that. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes back to the question of uh, where do the funds go, and donors are more, let's say, comfortable giving funds to uh, assistance, because it's more visible, because it's easier to monitor, of course, uh, than and uh, giving uh, funds to protection, that is something a bit blurry concept. You don't know how we will monitor that. Will it be efficient? We are going to talk to some people that may not be uh, uh, acceptable ones, and so on and so on. So I think this divide uh, is, I mean, is increasing uh, over time. Uh, there, there, there was an attempt. I think uh, by the UN sector as well, the protection clusters, by the by the nexus to make sure that guys we all work together. But here we have to be careful. We don't want to have an assistance uh, just uh, sugar coated with protection words. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to really make sure that 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 pure protection activities that includes. Prevention activities, I think this is very essential work done you through radios, through community engagement, all this work that is a bit, let's say, not really hard facts or hard to sell, this has to be preserved, this has to be promoted. Uh, by the top leadership um, uh, of organizations, the UN. And I think, and I believe that if we want, uh, that, uh, that we, if we want to have less assistance provided, and then increase protection, then we need really to support 
protection actors from the local ones to the international ones. And this is extremely important. And um, so, yes, I think I hope that the tribal nexus that is trying to, to, to explain that there are no silos anymore uh, are basically, let's say, uh, well uh, implemented uh, and, and understood by the ones who are actually providing the funds for the organizations to do. At the end of the day, so I be, one of my, let's say, um, points that I will, I will maybe uh, take out of this uh, question is really to have more and more discussions with the donors uh, at the earliest level that it's very important that they continue to support protection actors, that they don't uh, impeach or prevent humanitarian actors to talk to, uh, let's say, uh, entities that may be illegal with regard to the national legislation, because this is through this dialogue, this is through this uh, engagement that we succeed to have a success, uh, succeed to have a meaningful protection dialogue. So, yeah, I hope it answered more of the question, but it's a vast uh, question that the president asked that I would say uh, would uh, need, uh, let's say, a debate in itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely, and an admirable job on that one. Hashem, thank you so much. Um, let's try Paul again. Paul, do we have you on the line? Can you hear me this time? Yes, that sounds perfect. So I, I won't um, – did you, did you hear or did you see the question, uh, Paul, from Stephanie regarding the routine changing of top leadership? Uh, so I, I won't read it again. Um, I think there's usually a good reason – um, for moving internationals on. From my perspective, some of the uh, assignments these days are a bit short, but um, I think the change of personnel, if, if it's done thoroughly, if there is actually a handover, there's no reason why good connections can't be maintained. So I don't have a great problem with uh, um, the short-term assignments. Um, I mean, it's possible to extend if people are comfortable in their position. Um, but generally, I think it doesn't necessarily have to interfere with an operation. It does in some uh, situations, but it doesn't necessarily if it's done professionally and thoroughly. Over. Terrific. Thank you very much, Paul. And now a question from uh, Kiran. This is addressed to Tiffany, and it's ref it's referring back, Tiffany, to um, to that issue that uh, we discussed during uh, the theme you were coming in on earlier um, regarding uh, a designated protection actor. But it's a bit of a different spin. So the que question is as follows: In the most serious situations, is there a case? for one protection actor risking loss of access by speaking out, reporting, etc., uh, while others can then be prepared to step in and provide, um, uh, provide instead. So it's, it's essentially a question, Tiffany, about, um, in a sense, sort of sacrificing or putting, putting to the front line one protection actor, um, putting them, say, at risk of losing access um, by speaking out, um, but then with the, in a sense, backup plan of others being able to step forward, um, presumably with a more conservative approach in case that frontline actor does lose access. Any thoughts on this question, Tiffany? Yeah, sure. I mean, is there a case that could be made? Sure, of course there, could, there is. I think that it's a pretty, it would have to be a pretty extreme circumstance uh, if we were talking about an organization that was set up and depending how long they've been in the community and so on and so forth, uh, but in, in extreme and serious circumstances when nothing else is moving, that can be the, it could be a, a move to be considered. I also think that there's a, a number of, again, going back to the idea of creative solutions, ways of, of being able to approach those situations in terms of organizations that don't have full-time presence being willing to, to be the ones who draw attention to what's going on there, the diplomatic community leveraging uh, their their good offices, UN agencies or UN mission if there is one, that being able to leverage, uh, they're um, much less likely to to face that same kind of uh, um, eviction that a, a smaller organization would. So I think I like the spirit of the idea uh, that you know we should be willing to collaborate, to work together, and to, to keeping what I think I hear in that question is the central spirit is that the 
the primary importance is 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 reducing violence and and keeping civilians safe in and that is the number one priority over protecting our operations for the sake of protecting our operations. We're there for a purpose, and if we can't achieve that purpose through our regular operations, then we need to look at more creative engagement. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Um, we have, uh, we're a little bit over time, but I'd like to um, bring in one last question. This is to Jochen. The question is from Florence, who asks, who should be coordinating access? Should it be at all levels of staff who are involved or only management and HQ? What do you think, Joachim? Over to you. Mm. I mean, I think it's, um, it's first of all, um, the colleagues in the, in, in the field um, who, who manage access on a daily basis without probably knowing that they're doing so. Um, but then, like, at a technical level, I think it certainly should be um, – Everybody um, who's who's working in the field um, on a more than depending on what we're looking at, like more operational level, probably um, the the country office um, or a, a specialized person, and then at a strategic level, um, again, it would be in my opinion part of the country level uh, plus plus HQ. Um, yeah, but in general, I think for um, for for colleagues who are who are working in the field, um, we're all doing access all the time probably just not realizing it. And I think this is where where the important part starts, but it needs to be framed and conversations being had with like be that the, the general military command, the authorities, um, the ministries. Um, uh, but then this needs to, um, you know, should be set in like a wider framework the organization has or strategy the organization has um, um, related uh, relating to access. Perfect. Thanks so much. We're going to wrap things up now. I did want to point out on this last theme of coordination, we're going to have an entire session in this series that will be devoted to discussing such issues concerning coordination of access negotiations and protection, as well as civil coordination that will be uh, in the end of June. So I hope that all of you on the line now will be able to join us once again um, for that even more in-depth um, discussion on that particular angle. Um, but for now, I'm afraid we'll have to... Um, call it quits for the day. I'd really like to thank our, all of our panelists for their contributions. Wonderful to have all of you on the line. It's been a really, um, really helpful, really concrete discussion, looking at so many examples, both from your own experience as, um, as practitioners on the panel and also really addressing a lot of specific examples coming in from the participants in the webinar. So thanks so much to the panel and uh, all of the, uh, to the participants for all their active contributions before and during the event. There will be a recording of today's event, both in video and audio-only podcast format that will be available on the event page in the coming days. And as mentioned at the beginning, this event was the second in a series of four events on access and protection. The upcoming two events will continue to look at concrete issues that you've submitted. On June 11th, we'll be looking at situations related to access and protection that can put people at risk and how to avoid putting people at risk. And then, as I mentioned, on June 25th, we'll be discussing issues around coordination of access negotiations and protection, as well as civil coordination. And if you missed the first event in this series, which introduced the concepts of access and protection, uh, and then looked in particular on issues related to COVID-19, there is a recording of that available if you visit the event website. I hope you'll also be able to join us next week on 3rd of June, that's Wednesday. We will organize a discussion with ICFA on security risk management and duty of care during COVID-19. Then on the 5th of June, that's Friday next week, we'll be hosting a launch event for NRC's new toolkit for principled humanitarian action, which will include an exchange on the current state of the impact of counterterrorism measures on humanitarian organizations and the associated risks. You can 
can also continue the discussion in the PHAP online community. There's already been a lot of exchange among participants in the community on this topic, and I hope that you'll continue in this channel until our next live discussion. And for those of you who submitted questions, comments, uh, during today's event that we didn't have a chance to address, we can take those up in the community. It's a great opportunity to keep the conversation going there. So with that, once again, I'd like to thank everyone, both panelists and participants, as well as the team at PHAP dispersed around the world from Geneva to the Philippines, Kenya, and beyond. Thank you all for your help behind the scenes as well. For, it's been a very interesting discussion, and I look forward to next time. Thank you. This is Anne Herod Lang signing off from Geneva.